My name is Dr. Emil Goos and I am the President of the Board of Directors of ICDL. April marks Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, a time for us to come together and celebrate the uniqueness and brilliance of individuals on the autism spectrum. It is a month where we not only raise awareness, but also foster acceptance and inclusion in our communities. It is our collective responsibility to create a world where every individual, regardless of their neurodiversity, is valued, respected and even given equal opportunities. We must also advocate for policies and practices that promote inclusion and accessibility in education, employment, healthcare and even beyond. But above all, let us listen. Let us listen to the voices of individuals with autism and their families. Let us learn from their experiences, their joys, their struggles, and even their triumphs. Let us amplify their voices to empower them, to advocate for themselves, for its diversity, that we find strength, resilience, and boundless possibilities. Thank you. You're listening to Affect Autism where Affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. Welcome listeners to the We Chose Play podcast. I am so thrilled this week to introduce Kim Kredich, American born, Toronto raised, East Coast schooled. She has a BA in music and psychology from Duke, a master's in music and conducting from the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. She was a faculty member briefly at the music school in Rhode Island, ended up in Knoxville where she has served as a volunteer advocate for hundreds, if not more, of students with disabilities in East Tennessee, working with families to help their children gain rightful supported inclusion in the general education environment in public schools through the IEP, Individualized Education Plan, process. She has worked closely with attorneys in Tennessee to promote systemic change and awareness of the rights of people with disabilities. A musician, an educator, a relentless advocate, and also Ben Kredich's mother, the incredible Kim Kredich. Welcome, Kim. Oh, thanks for having me, Daria. (laughs) Now, Kim's family was uh, the keynote speakers at the recent New York City ICDL's uh, and Rebecca Schools uh, co-hosted a DIR Floor Time International Conference. Kim's family founded DIR Floor Time very early on when her son Ben was two and a half years old. She wrote a Floor Time song called Circles Around the Sun over the span of 20 years, and that's Sun, S-O-N. And it was recorded in 2021 when her son, Ben, had come full circle into a life of independent living with supports, having job opportunities, and having attended four years of college in the UT, University of Tennessee, future program, an inclusive post-secondary opportunity for students with intellectual disabilities and autism. Now, sadly, last summer, Ben was killed instantly at the age of 24 from behind by an impaired driver while walking on a sidewalk towards downtown Knoxville. If you haven't already, please view the family's website, which I will post in the blog post, a link to it, dedicated to Ben, where you can view the recorded live stream of the celebration of life and hear the family's heartfelt descriptions of their life with Ben, which was so influenced by Floor Time, especially Kim's talk, which described the Floor Time journey and introduced her Floor Time song, Circles Around the Sun. So please do refer to that. The link is in the blog post. But today, Kim is a wealth of knowledge about inclusion and the law. She knows IDEA. This is all she's done for the past 20 years. She is not an attorney, does not give legal advice, but knows about inclusion in the public school system. So Kim, I have to tell you, this is the number one topic, I think, at Parent Support uh, that I facilitate every week for ICDL. They're, you know, children just not being included or um, just not, teachers not understanding the needs of our children in public schools. And I I just want to say when we say when we talk about inclusion in public schools and we are specifically today talking about the United States. Now I am Canadian, but many of the people that view this are in the United States. So what are we talking about when we talk about inclusion in public schools. We're really talking about the law, the basics of the law. Um, IDEA individuals with disabilities education act and also ADA 
they overlap somewhat, but IDEA is specific to public school from uh, age three through 22, until a child turns 22, potentially. So IDEA has a, what's called a least restrictive environment provision. And that is essentially a student's right to be educated alongside typically developing peers, that means peers without an IEP, uh, for the school day to the maximum extent possible with a full range of supports and services. That includes a one-on-one -on -one aid, that includes pull out to, to a resource room or push in by a special education teacher, uh, everything, related services, OT, PT, music therapy, speech therapy, the the it really runs the gamut. I would challenge people to think of what couldn't be pushed into the general ed setting um, that would cause an IEP team to segregate to a self-contained classroom. There is a full continuum of alternative placements. Don't get me wrong. We've just found that it is sometimes more pushed towards segregated settings for various reasons. Um, teachers just don't know. Those are members of the IEP team. Maybe the funding has not worked towards uh, in alignment with the, the law, but it is basically a student's right to be included in the zone school with a full range of supplementary supports and services before considering the removal of the, out to a, a segregated setting, a more restrictive environment. So what happens when the school says, sorry, we can't possibly provide all of this for your child. <laughs> well, that definitely happened to us many times at the beginning and we had to fight for it. I basically put my music career to the side because it became a full-time job to fight for Ben's right. And again, or I should say that having twins, so Miles and Ben were born in 1999 and Coleman, our youngest son, was born in 2001. So this goes way back, but when you've got twins, it is a very real stark reality that to not include one twin <laughs> means that your family is sort of split apart. They might recommend a different school. Well, then you've got twins at a different school, which just wouldn't happen naturally. So this is our story, and it's very different than if people might have an only child, where they might choose to homeschool or go to a private school. You know, everybody has a different story. So this is unique to us, but I do think it will re resonate with a lot of people who just are thinking, why can't my child be served in their zone school in the general ed setting as much as possible? So when we were told, oh, we don't have the resources, that, that caused me, just parent, you know, ordinary parent, to have to educate that school. And then the digger, you know, the more you dig deep, you find, oh, this is maybe a systemic problem that it's, they've never done it this way before. And that means you almost have to carry the whole system with you to make change. You have to make, you have to really get out there. Um, so you're not just the one off or you know, at least alert people, hey, for our kid, you're going to do this according to the law. And so that's what we did. And they were sort of shocked. Um, but boy, you wouldn't believe the hearts and minds that were changed all along the way in Knoxville, Tennessee. And also we started out in Rich Richmond, Virginia, and they did. They, they changed once they saw um, the impact of inclusion on not just Ben, but the rest of the class. And that is where I think people maybe don't understand that it's every child's right under IDEA to be educated together. So it's the students without disabilities who benefit and the data bear this out. Uh, 50 years of research bears this out that the, the outcomes for students without disabilities, the test scores go up, um, never mind empathy, problem solving, when a student with a disability is properly included, I'm talking about a pervasive disability like autism or Down syndrome or cerebral palsy, because that brings supports into the classroom that benefit all the students and the teacher. It benefits the teacher to support all the students and it creates 
it's a beautiful learning environment. So whenever people are told, no, we can't support your child, you've got to go through some of the myths and some of the basic ones that I've heard over and over, which are just myths and not facts, they're the opposite, is a one-on-one -on -one aid is the most restrictive environment. That's not true. It can't be true because a one-on-one -on -one aid is actually part of IDEA as a way to support a student's least restrictive environment in the general ed setting. And if they say, oh, it's because they restrict that student, they hover over them, you just say, well, that's not on the child. That's teacher tra or aid training. You know, that doesn't make sense. And another big myth is your child can't keep up. Well, that means that you can modify the content, even to the point where they take what's called an alternate assessment, which is about 1% of the population. And you can be, you know, so smart in the ways that Ben was so smart and so verbal by the end. He wasn't quite you know, speaking, um, or I should say, he, he wasn't not ever nonverbal. He was always had language, but he couldn't express it, I should say. But by the end, he had better vocabulary than a lot of people. By the time he was about halfway through high school, his vocabulary and his back and forth communication was exquisite. So when when they say, oh, he, he's not at the level. Well, he was on modified content. He got a special ed diploma, but he was on what I feel are this, is the same track as his brothers, his brothers who did not have disabilities and they all had the right to uh, public schooling and further education, future employment, independent living. Those are the three tenets of IDEA. And so they all moved through that the same way. And let's, let's repeat those three tenets for the listeners. Sure. Further education, future employment, and independent living. And that's going to look different for every kid with an IEP, but it's that's the purpose. That's the written purpose of IDEA is to move towards those goals, however that looks. And so when you look at that outcome for everyone, that's exactly what Ben moved towards with the special ed diploma. But did he have further education? Yes. He went to UT Future Program for four years, went to classes, engaged, would raise his hand and answer questions in full like 450 lectures, <laughs> you know, people lectures, um, went to football games, just lived in the, um, the, the UT Future Program students were able to live in the dorms actually due to Ben's advocacy. He started that, went in front of the Senate Education Committee. So he was an advocate in himself and um, ended up playing piano at assisted living centers using paratransit support. So he would use public transportation to get him to and from work. Uh, so he was independent of mom driving him, you know, <laughs> no 22, 23 year old wants that, I think. And um, so it's future ed further education, future employment, and independent living. And he lived just a mile away from us. Um, we'd take him out shopping for his groceries, but he could certainly have ordered online. We just, you know, enjoyed it. And he enjoyed that too. So that's just this the, the, the parallel paths. And I can say this because I've, you know, had three very, very different sons with and they had different journeys through the public education process and on to further education, future employment and independent living. It, it really is um, an incredible story of your fierce advocacy. And you know, when I think of us being called parent advocates, what are we advocates for? We're advocates for the rights of our children who have disabilities and, um, there's so much that you've done, I think, to lay the groundwork for other parents that just don't have the time or resources that you had. And you, you've you said at the keynote, you were privileged to have this opportunity where you could leave your career to focus on this. And as a part of giving back, you volunteered your time helping hundreds and hundreds of students over the years. So what what is the first step? like a, a 
um, you know, I have a lot of parents come to the parent support group who are English as a second language, immigrants to the United States. And in my, um, you know, possibly judgmental assessment of what they're telling me, they're being discriminated against for that. Um, now, that may or may not be true, but they're sort of being talked down to is what I see and being told sorry. And what is the first step? Are there are there resources that they can reach out to with without every single person having to have a Kim credit in their back pocket? <laughs> right, because um, because you shouldn't have to. And and honestly, that's why I did as a volunteer, because I saw how hard it was for me. And I don't speak English as a second language. And I'm you know, I've got educational background and and I was treated terribly. So it's not just people who are vulnerable in those senses. It was, it had more to do with um, the systemic uh, <laughs> denial of students' rights throughout two different school districts, actually. Um, well, first I wanna say that you're the, you're the expert. You, the parent is the expert on their child and with floor time, while you can't or shouldn't be able to gear a, an IEP, an individualized education plan, to a certain methodology, you can uh, create what I call a floor time IEP through accommodations. And so those are the things for these listeners who are obviously into DIR floor time. I would say you've got the right to um, request an accommodation to follow the child's interests, to utilize interest. We had an accommodation for Ben that was uh, utilize musical and rhythmic strategies. So that's on top of, you know, just your, your related services that can also help with that individualized plan, like OT, PT, speech therapy, music therapy, dance therapy, art therapy. Um, you can really ensure that the IEP team is listening to you. I would always bring a friend and I would always, for the sake of just the record, for the sake of the school district, get used to recording your IEP meetings. Um, it, they will do it too. It's just a good thing to establish so you don't have to take notes. And especially if you, English is your second language and there are a lot of terms being thrown around or if a partner or spouse um, a relative can't come to the meeting, then they're able to listen to it after with you and talk about it. So a recorded device should not be seen as adversarial. And you can really, you know, you want to work collaboratively, collaboratively with the school at, at all times, ideally. And if you put it out there, this is to help me, this is to help my understanding, it will help me focus more and be part of the IEP team. I think that's the first thing you do. You can, there are wonderful resources, probably in each person's state. Um, one national resource that I think is one of the best is called COPA, Council of Parent Advocates and Attorneys. Um, this is C-O-P-A-A -A um, dot, whatever, you'll put the link in, <laughs> you put the link in. The wealth of uh, resources, knowledge, um, chat groups, and it's all centered around advocating for students' rights. So there are parents, there are advocates, paid volunteer or parent advocates and attorneys. And this is a very um, gl glued together community of people representing the rights of students with disabilities. So I encourage anybody to go there it is such a small membership fee for so much. And if you're a parent, if you're a student, it's hugely discounted. It's just, it's just priceless, I think, in a lot of ways. So get yourself a friend, um, work together with people in your community. A lot of people here, you know, I was just the one person going to IEP meetings. Well, now we've got, I've stopped doing that. I've officially retired, but in the meantime, I was able to uh, gather a group of parents who caught the spark, you know, and there, there will be 
three to five parents along with the parent of the child with a disability going to each other's IEP meetings. And that can not only change for those students, but then you get up in front of the school board and you talk about the systemic issues and you put forth a collaborative mindset, look at the numbers and that in that way, you're really reaching out to the greater good. And so while I would always say to a parent, look, I'm looking out for number one. And number one right now is your kid. <laughs> so that is what we're concentrating on. But by your child getting what he she deserves under the law, you will essentially be pushing for good, pushing for the greater good, because that means that more teachers and administrators and other families will see how it is actually supposed to work. And that you don't want to just move the needle bit by bit, but then you can get a larger community advocating for everyone else so that they don't have to know, a, you know, somebody knowledgeable enough to be doing this as an unfortunate hobby, I always say. Now, um, I'm just thinking like I, I heard an example of a parent who said the school will not will not allow our aid. They want to provide their own aid for my child and my child doesn't have a relationship with that person or that person doesn't understand a floor time approach or that person is too behavioral or or whatever it is. So that's the first question. And then the second sort of part B to that is, you know, parents may not be able to afford attorney, an attorney to come with them to these meetings. And so how do you stand up to a school that just keeps saying no and you say, but it's the law and they say, no, it's not. So the, the answer to the first question might be wildly unpopular, but I'm always a voice for the truth. Now, if you think about it, if everybody, well, first of all, it's very hard to afford an aid. So there are very few families I know that can afford an, um, an aid on their own dime. That said, there are now outside service providers that are covered by insurance and uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, we just had a policy change to allow those providers to come in. But that's for, um, you know, specifically behavioral uh, support. The school system, you want them to be providing that person. And the way that you communicate what, you know, how that support is delivered is to talk about that child's unique needs. And that's where the parent is like Dorothy with the ruby slippers, right? Like that's where your power is. You are the parent and you can advocate for the child needing that relationship. Uh, I don't know anybody who would say, no, we don't believe in a child having a relationship. You know? uh, that, that would be hard for them to say. And then you can also show videos of what works at home. I think this is one of the most obvious things to do and very rarely done. When you've got a school system that says, nope, our own, well, then you say, okay. But then if there are problems, right? If there are no problems, then you've got to be kind of happy with what the school is providing. If there is something that they're saying, they won't do it. They won't do their work. Well, maybe it's not being adapted properly under accommodations or modified under modifications, or the aid is not um, doing maybe all that he or she could do that would support that student's learning. And if you show, hey, this is in a DIR, I'm filming a DIR session, and this is how you can, you know, like they say, can't, won't say does, will. <laughs> and if you go in it with, a, <laughs> you know, sometimes they say, look, earn an Oscar nomination. You might be so angry, but if you go in just like your, your child is at that school and you want, you don't want it to be adversarial. And if you show support for the teacher, support for the school, and sometimes it, it just doesn't work. But that is what I would say, because 
I don't know who goes into teaching that doesn't, that, you know, doesn't want to help kids learn. And so you got to really key into that basic fact about a student who is, or a person who has dedicated themselves to the teaching profession. So I would say inclusion is really the way it will help everybody support that student. So that's why I always say, look at their inclusive rights first, because in a segregated setting, that's when I find it's mostly chaotic, not enough support. There are multi-grade, you know, K through five. You've got an old older fifth grader and a kindergartner. It's just not set up for success for anyone, I think. And that's why I would say you've got to look at whether your child can be legally under the basics of the law included in the regular ed setting with that support, with modified content if needed, with breaks, alternative workspace. I mean, it goes on and on. So you first need to know what's actually available. And a lot of that is on the internet. <laughs> a lot of it's on the internet. You can also push for uh, districts, get up in front of the school board and say, hey, have we thought of bringing in some, some organizations that promote, that partner with school districts to provide best inclusive practices. That's like uh, inclusive schooling up at Syracuse, um, Maryland Coalition for Inclusive Education, MCIE. Uh, just there are lots of places, leaders in this country, and maybe you have to do a request for a proposal for that. That's the larger scale. Your second question was, what do you do if you can't afford an attorney? Well, look to COPA and look to file an administrative complaint. You do not need an attorney to do that. Um, you, can, you can go to COPA to find probably some examples. You can go, to, you know, take some seminars. I know around in this state, Vanderbilt has a wonderful seminar about advocacy uh, and you can get scholarships to those. So learn your stuff or get together with other people who know it. Sort of become, I say, the Power Rangers. You know, you, you don't need a bunch of people having the same skill. You need a group of people who are comfortable doing different parts of it and team together. Uh, that's, I just say, you've got you've to act. It's overwhelming. I do want to make sure people understand how hard it was for me. Uh, I call the early days the dark days. While Ben ended up being beautifully, you know, a, a, a conversational and very independent and, um, you know, a joy and just social, uh, he still had his challenges. But in the early days, it was so hard. I mean, lots of head banging, you know, he couldn't express himself just like a lot of the parents who are listening, I just can't emphasize how hard it was to face autism and the realities of it. Luckily we found DIR floor time, but it doesn't just change overnight. It's a whole process that took years and years, honestly. Um, and then you see the results bit by bit, but then in totality. Uh, so doing that while having to go up against a school system is can be really devastating. In fact, the five year anniversary, I'll never forget. It was um, it was five years because 2001, August 14th, you know, was diagnosis day. And that five year anniversary came by and we were in Knoxville having spent four years in Richmond, Virginia, and then moving here. And I said, oh wow, it's, D-Day, diagnosis day, five years later, Matt, what's been, um, what's been harder, autism or the school system? And he just laughed and he said, oh, that's a rhetorical question, the school system, of course. Isn't that, that's sad to me because it was so hard. <laughs> autism took so much of our energy and our soul, especially to raise three kids in a... <laughs> as happy a home as possible 
with all this and floor time was a huge commitment. I, I think at the at the keynote speech, I, I said, well, I fell short almost every day. Sometimes I couldn't even do one 20 minute session of floor time. And I was supposed to do four to, four to six. And I, but then I looked at the floor time Ben was getting with his siblings or at the playground or in school. And I thought, okay, it's the philosophy, it's the commitment and you do the best you can. And sure enough, that is, that is what pushed us all the way through to seeing the beautiful, you know, results of that work. Well, I always think it's like anything in life. Like, you know, I wanted to work out more. I wanted to, you know, start different types of exercises, um, eat less junk food or whatever. None of us are going to hold ourselves to some perfect standard. Like if only I had not had bubble tea those 10 days last month. And if I had not had that Laura Secord chocolate bar that I loved for Easter, then I would be five pounds lighter. Like while that's true, do we hold ourselves to these standards of perfection when it comes to diet and exercise? I mean, we all aim for it. So why do parents do that to themselves with floor time? Like we're only human. We can't possibly be the perfect floor time parent 24 seven. Uh, we have to work, you know, work on our own regulation as well and balance it out. And I think just like with exercise or anything, doing something at least as often as you can is better than nothing. And so I know that a lot of us parents, especially when many of us have neurodivergences of some kind diagnosed or otherwise, because of, of autism is genetic, we feel overwhelmed and don't even know where to start sometimes and just taking little steps. And I think, I hope that with this podcast, people go to the blog post, first step, look up COPA, C-O-P-A-A -A dot, whatever it is, we'll put the link, <laughs> the Organization for Advocacy for Inclusion of Children, and just look some stuff up, even if that's all you do for this week. And then next week, maybe one more step, and then maybe contacting one other parent who's going through the same thing. And just slowly, you'll be surprised in one year, the things that can progress. And like Kim said, this didn't happen overnight. I mean, she had to fight and fight. And now that she has the, the globe of Ben's life that was completed, she can look in this globe and say, this was this perfect life that he led that was filled with imperfections and all of these things that we worked on ended up working out in the end it's a process and so i i don't know if i said that very eloquently but i just i just want parents to not feel so overwhelmed because it is overwhelming like you said well and i think that that speaks to what i viewed as the necessity of it working in public school and i'll reiterate we you know when you have twins and we had three kids under three. <laughs> ben was diagnosed when Coleman was three months and we had just moved to a brand new state with a dog and no fence. And it and, and got, I assume you moved because your husband got his new job position. So a new career. Yeah. So that's yeah. a big stressor as yeah. well. Right. We moved from Brown University, where he was a swim coach there for nine years, had kids right at the end, but never got, you know, we had sensory integration um, and Miles had possible verbal apraxia. So he had speech so, and then Coleman was born right before we moved. So to uh, University of Richmond and of course now here at University of Tennessee. So, so that's been our, our track. And in each case, what I realized is the fight for inclusion in the public school, his rightful basic rights under IDEA and ADA had to, they had to happen. It was, it was necessary so that he could sort of benefit from the natural floor time opportunities that public school and going with his twin brother to public school had to offer. Everyone's situation is different, but I would just say, if you look at a lot of people are scared, 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 scared. And why not? Why wouldn't they be? If their children are unreliable speakers, um, then you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe at school, they can't tell you. Well, that's why I would say go for 
their inclusive rights under IDEA because there are always eyes on everything and good eyes, just other parents and parents are the ones of other kids who can end up being the biggest supporters. Well, actually the classmates usually end up being the biggest supporters and the general ed teachers and then other special ed teachers who see the push in support and everybody can learn if it's not happening yet in your district. That's why to me, it was worth the advocacy because floor time, the philosophy, it can happen for seven hours a day at school. <laughs> and that does mean, you, you know, um, individual differences, developmental, relationship-based, all of that can be infused, should be infused in the IEP. If your child needs a break, because of developmental or sensory, you know, individual differences, they get a break, but it can be a purposeful break. It can be a let's walk with the aid to the office um, and you can work on a speech goal, one circle of communication or back and forth interaction, right? That's building floor time right in there with a, a faux envelope that the child takes and hands it and makes, you know, that circle of communication with the school secretary hands it back and then they get the walking the sensory input it, it can just all work together but it has to be a team effort and in order to get that you might have to vote some people off your island <laughs> the IEP island vote some other people on or bring people into your island and every year you're going to have probably a different teacher because you're going from grade to grade and it's that journey of maybe a school a zoned school to saying hey look at this child when they came in oh my gosh and they become believers in the right thing i just say it's the right thing it's a student's um, pro progress it's a student's growth so I think you've got to take a few leaps of faith in the people who go into teaching as a profession, get to know your zone school. The greatest thing about a zone school is that you've got your neighborhood kids right there. And so, and your rights are strongest. Your legal rights are strongest at your zone school because you're actually not supposed to go out to a different school unless you request a transfer. That's sort of different but you're not supposed to go out unless there's a program that's not available at your zone school. And I would say, beware of programs because in my experience, students with pervasive disabilities, such as autism, Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, I, I do it all, you know, it's all the same under the law. It's the same law for the whole nation. Um, the bare minimum is IDEA and then states can go above and beyond that. But it is all you know, support, modifications if needed, good modifications, modified content, which gives you access to the general curriculum while you're making meaningful progress on IEP goals. And maybe those are the two biggest things that I think parents need to know. There are only two requirements to being satisfactorily educated. It is with as a student with a disability make meaningful progress on IEP goals you don't even have to meet the goals just make meaningful progress and if those goals are correct and you can always change the goals they're supposed to be calculated for the child to make meaningful progress but that better be first and foremost in an inclusive setting and only if there's data to show that you cannot make meaningful progress in IEP goals and gain access to the general curriculum do you even consider removing them? Now, resource room is a supplementary service. So when I say removing to a segregated setting, technically resource room is for only students with IEPs. That's, there's a, there's a different rung for what's called a special class. So the rungs of the continuum of alternative placements is such, and this is important regular class with a full range of supplementary supports and services to include one-on-one -on -one aid, pull out to resource, push in called itinerant instruction. That's right there in the law. They give resource room and itinerant instruction as examples of supplementary service. Then 
And only then would you pull to a special class. And so there's been some interesting, slippery, slidey language saying, oh, they're both special ed settings. So the school can do whatever. And they start a child in resource. And then the next year, all of a sudden, that kid is in what looks like and feels like a special class. And the school system says, oh, it's just a special ed setting. And it's not, it is not resource. It is a multi-age class using an alternative curriculum. So you've got to be wary and just go with the language of the law and question it. So that's what I would just say. You've got to really take a look at your zone school and imagine and, and research what are all the possibilities for your child and ask around. That is every child's right to be considered first and foremost with what I consider are the most necessary elements to include and the most basic. You can get into music therapy, OT. Those are related services that tie to goals, IEP goals. But basically, if you were to say one room schoolhouse, okay? Look at a one room schoolhouse. Um, okay, there's a kid with autism or Down syndrome. Are you going to create a whole other school just for that one kid? No. How would you bring that child in? They don't need to be at grade level. They can have modified content. They can have extra support brought in from the village, you know, <laughs> to support that student, which is supports all students. They can have all these accommodations, break time, alternative workspace, you can go out to the playground and do math through hopscotch, right? That just, those are all available under IDEA and utilize the child's interests and have the child with a disability who's maybe on modified content go up in front of the class to help teach. I, I, I have a perfect example of this and it is irregular verbs. And I'd sort of forgotten what those were until I went to an IEP meeting where somebody had shown what the regular second grade class was doing. Irregular verbs, hide, hid, fly, flew, <laughs> right? Um, so that particular student who had Down syndrome, has Down syndrome, uh, on modified content, not expected to do the standard to the level that the rest of the second graders were. That was an agreement of the whole IEP team. Well, what would you do before that? You'd say, how is this child child max going to participate. And the idea is, well, when they're introducing it, he's listening and he's got some maybe pictures that he's able to use his sight words for fly maybe and do that with a bird. Then while they're working on that worksheet, he can always listen to schoolhouse rock or something um, with verb, you know, the verb action person and then maybe the parent has sent in a tablecloth and then Max writes a big V for verb <laughs> and puts it on goes in front of the class and the teacher says Max I want you to fly and Max flies and then the rest of the and then the teacher says Max just and everybody yells out flew <laughs> you know okay Max hide Max hides he just hid like that is best inclusive practices. And then all the other kids will probably want to do that too. So it's not just for that student with a disability, but that gets, that gets like, like Greenspan always said, that gets things cooking in the classroom. It's engaging. And those kids are going to learn that better and, and have more fun than if they were in a classroom without a student like Max. So that is why the outcomes do show greater gains all across the board for students with and without disabilities when a student with a disability or students are properly included in regular classrooms. So there's my soapbox, but I hope that shows the kind of education that all students deserve, because as I say, the students without disabilities have the right to be educated with the students with disabilities. And who usually goes on to have kids with disabilities? Oh, people without disabilities. <laughs> and what's so important to learn in school well, is 
an inclusive environment and the school lays the foundation for an inclusive society where employers, employees, um, just everyone is, is benefiting from that basic right from the time they're born and get early intervention. And then age three through 22, unless they get a regular diploma before that, are entitled to this incredible opportunity. Everybody is. So that includes all children. And a number of parents, their child is non-speaking at this time. I love how you pointed that out at the conference that in Greenspan's book, he said, your child may not be speaking yet. And at the time your child was not speaking yet. And so it doesn't mean that every child has to end up speaking verbally. People have wonderful lives who aren't um, speaking verbally and communicate in other ways. But uh, a, a two part question as, as quick as we can cover this um, in a short podcast. Um, what do people do when the school refuses to use the device that the child is most, most comfortable with at home? For example, a parent said their child uses a nine by six AAC device, like a nine by six grid, and the school wants to give them a three by three or something, a three by two, and that's not enough options for their child. You just throw yeah. the law in their face in a cooperative way, like. Yeah, actually that's an ADA law, Americans with Disabilities Act. And a student, any person, any person is, uh, has the right to their preferred method of communication. And a lot of times they, the school won't know that. And so that's why I always say, look, don't try to embarrass anyone or say, look at me, I know this and you should know that. Just, you got to do it a little bit. You know, the first step is to say, well, but right here, it says under ADA that they're entitled to their you know, the their preferred method of communication. And a lot of times what will happen is then that will go up to a higher up in the district and that person will be like, oh yeah, that parent's right. Or, ooh, I never saw that. And you wanna, you know, you, you wanna give them an out uh, always and do the right things. What if they say, well, that's your preferred method for your child. Your child's too young to know their preferred method yet or some ridiculous comeback like that. Well. Then you would, um, I think that you would have to look at data and Show videos and it, of your child. Using yes, that's enough, maybe. I always just say, my gosh, show a video when you're out in the community and they're doing this. And usually you will find that if they're saying this is their preferred method and you say they're, you know, you, a lot of the times the, the child can say, I want to use this or but you just show them show them what works. In fact, there's new guidance, just January, 2024 from OSEP. It's tons of guidance about AAC devices. And so I would encourage people to look that up. Just Google, um, I think it'll probably be OSEP guidance, AAC. O-S-E-P? Yeah, the Office, Office of Special education populations. It's basically the U.S. Department of Special Education or OSERS, or, but OSEP, they did just come out with this incredibly detailed guidance that I think will put everybody on the right path. And that's a good thing to provide. Um, it includes things like, is training required under IDEA? Yes. You know, what are the delays that can happen? Ooh, don't delay. I mean, it, it really spells it out. It was much needed. And that presentation was actually just made um, by somebody at the COPA conference uh, in Atlanta just in March. It was breaking news, basically. So take advantage of the the information that's out there and then bring it nicely to your district. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, self-advocates are saying teach children alternative ways of communicating as early as possible, uh, provide them their, you know, preferred means of communication, like you had said, and self-advocates are also saying inclusive, inclusive education. That's what we deserve. That's what we want. And so we've been talking a lot about um, our views as parents, but I just did want to point out that self-advocates are saying the same thing. Yeah. And you've got to be, um, you know, 
when somebody's able to advocate for themselves and a lot of people non-speakers are now for example utilizing spelling to communicate and now people are hearing their experiences in school and how they were presumed incompetent and there are people going on for their college degrees um, right in Nashville I know I know a young woman who's in her junior year uh, at Belmont University utilizing the spelling to communicate she's a math whiz and uh you know, it's happening now that that this is you do want to, I think, try everything out, give a full array and then would label everything. But he had he he didn't go back and forth, but he could label and he could spell and spell backwards. But boy, that that circle of communication just stopped right around 18 months he wouldn't ask for juice using the word juice he just started to scream and i think that that was the scariest thing and it was so slow but that's where, that's where i feel floor dir floor time uh was was what was the path that that worked absolutely best for us I would just say keep keep engaging with the child, and I believe that then, and again, just become knowledgeable about everything that is out there, so that you can consider everything. Yeah. I told that whole story about how I read the child with special needs. I did the cardigan thing with the pocket. I put the the car in the pocket, and at first Ben slapped my hand away, but because I had read this in that book, I tried it again, and the second time, which would never have happened, in fact, the first time wouldn't have happened, I would never have thought to playfully obstruct, and now I can't think of, like, not ever doing that, but that's what, that's what I mean by go outside yourself, floor time insists that you go outside yourself to follow that child's lead. And that's the most beautiful thing and the most beautiful philosophy, honestly, I think as humans that we can connect that way. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of things before we sign off. Um, okay, so we made it clear that this is an example of Kim's case. She had three children under age three. She wanted the twins to be together. Inclusion was important for her. My son is an only child. He had severe brain inflammation, intellectual disability, um, developmentally uh, can seem to be a lot younger than he is. And before I knew about all of this, I've just assumed he can't possibly be in public school because he's way behind academically. And so I wanna clarify this point and, and you know, uh, segregated um, environment has worked for my son, but it's very specific circumstances that are unique to my family and everybody is different. So before people, you know, um, listen to this and say, well, that won't, you know, I know there's a lot of naysaying going around when people feel overwhelmed. So they can say, well, the example Kim gave about, putting the child down syndrome in front of the room being a demonstration for other kids my child won't do that my okay this was just one example <laughs> that's yeah, fine if, I, if you do you want me to give you a floor time example of ben in second grade i will we, we can do that but what i want to focus on is what you said yeah i definitely want that example and i and i just want to stress that these examples may not work for your child, but figure out what does work for your child because there is a way and nobody can tell that to you. That's the hardest part is nobody can tell you your specific path. You need to find that and you need support from others to do that. And Kim is giving an example of how she did that. And so I want to, um, to hear that example that you have a floor time example of including Ben in the regular classroom, but also what, you know, I've assumed my child is behind academically, so can't be in grade level. And you said a few times, and I want to highlight this for listeners, modified content, not the same as the other kids. So some people listening might say, what are you talking about? Like, then how can they be in grade five if they're not doing grade five work? So what does that mean? And then give us the example with Ben. Okay, yes. Modified content is crucial and it has to be done. It has to be prepared. And hopefully there's a modifications bank. Maybe there's a, 
a little consult support group uh, in the district or make one, um, just like there's vision support, just like there's sometimes even autism support, modifying content is so important. And a lot of times the states will have examples, exemplars of what that can look like. So when you think of um, algebra, okay, you're thinking algebra. Now, I don't even remember algebra. <laughs> but the one thing I do remember about algebra is you use things that you know to find the thing you don't know, right? To find X. You isolate what you don't know and you use that to isolate, to understand X equals. Okay, rainbow. The colors of the rainbow. So you might be in eighth grade as a student with a disability or ninth grade, whenever they're doing that, or pre-algebra before that. And you've got a rainbow a student who likes art or just, you know, knows the rainbow. And so you've got the rainbow and then you do another rainbow, but maybe it goes red, orange, and then clear. And then green, blue, purple. I think I got that right. And you put X in, you know, you can even use a manipulative X and then say, oh, what's X? And then if you've got like a rainbow in pieces, you, you can do this with construction paper, work on cutting, work on all these other wonderful basic functional skills, as well as the higher order of, of access to the general curriculum. And the general curriculum happens to be algebra. Don't hold that hostage when a child can't add or subtract or multiply and divide. They get everything. They get angles. They get, you know, um, World War One. They get, they get the water cycle. They get cells. They get everything modified. And yes, yes, everything can be modified to the very, you know, I hate to say lowest level. I say individualized level for any student to gain access to that. So that student would say, oh, well, I don't see yellow and they can compare that or they might already know it and X equals yellow, that's algebra. And I will give you, that's a great example with Ben actually because he was so good at music um, and rhythm. We'd show like quarter, quarter, eighth X quarter. <laughs> equals whole note. Well, then you can put all the notes on the other side and the X equals an eighth note, whatever. Just use tortellini, I don't care. You know, use whatever you need to, that is, that's the floor time approach. Individualize it and that's the law. You've got to individualize it. So it does work out for floor time. During COVID, Kim, you know, we had to do online schooling and they wanted to do math and they had, you know, equations and they had a grid I printed out and, you know, my son wanted nothing to do with it. Well, he started liking Super Mario. So I went and got his Mario Hot Wheels cars and I said, look, this grid is a parking lot. Let's park the Mario cars. How many cars are there? Answered, what if three drive away? How many are left? All of a sudden he loves math. It's just, it's so simple to just take what the ch child loves and build it into something that's meaningful for them. Well, yeah, and that reminds me of the DIR Floor Time Conference in McLean, Virginia, or Tyson's Corner in 2003 that I attended as a parent panelist and Temple Grandin was the keynote speaker. And I had a wonderful conversation with her actually in the bathroom at that conference, just I will never forget it, but this is exactly what she said. And you can read her books and see that she was into horses. So make everything about horses. And that is floor time. That is utilize students' interest and it is an accommodation that is available. And I would highly promote it as the biggest force in an IEP, because just like you said, that's the thing that you're going to follow it's just following the lead. You just followed his lead and engaged and circles of communication and he learned. And it's fun <laughs> and it's not, you know, a fight or like, but you've got to do this. Uh. And that is, uh, that's exactly what Temple Grandin said. And there was a kid at 
that I knew who was so into escalators is very smart. In fact, I think he took his parents' credit card and ordered an escalator. Um, <laughs> yeah, this was in Richmond, Virginia. But make everything about escalators. You know, make make like even moving up, like do whatever it is, and then something will change, right? The interest will change. It was like, oh, guess what? Now we're on to uh, RVs elevators or whatever. Ele or anything and you shift it because that is the way to reach and to teach and that is just best inclusive practices figure out a way to to maybe include if you don't have to be in a school to do this get a neighbor you know who will spend five minutes playing with mario kart or like a kid you know like get them together and just say hey here please do this I'm making cookies and uh, whatever. It's fun. It's fun to interact that way. But my example of, yeah, Ben wasn't going to get up in front of the class and do what the teacher wanted. No, no, no. Ben liked dinosaurs at a certain point and would play with dinosaurs. So the, the school, the teacher, this wonderful second grade teacher had other kids who were done with their work go to Ben and play with the dinosaurs and that was working on his goal for turn taking, right? And that was basically floor time <laughs> right there in the class. And of course, everybody wanted to finish up their work to go play with Ben. And that teacher was so wonderful, made sure that it wasn't just the people who, you know, she'd give opportunities in other ways so that people wouldn't have to rush through their work. But I'm just saying that's, that is truly bringing in the student into Ben's world, in their interacting and, and, and having that beautiful dance or those circles of communication. So yeah, I've gotten very good at, when you say you're, you've got to find it, well, also ask other people like kooky creative people like, like me who, um, hey, what would, you, what would you do? And honestly, kids are the ones who have the best ideas. Ben's siblings are like, well, what about this? You know, why don't I chase him here? And then, you know, whatever. Oh, oh my gosh. They're the, they're the future floor timers. They're natural floor timers. As long as you um, encourage, encourage it. Because a lot of kids will be like, that kid's weird. I don't get it. Maybe I'll bully them. That's where you have to really work to have, you know, have those birthday parties, make those go out of your comfort zone. I know it's hard, but it it's worth it. And you'll only find that when you do go out and reach out. You know, autism, what is it that the official definition is to oneself, I think, right? Autism, isn't that the origin of the word? It's like self. And what I have found is that that is the most ironic thing to call this because what autism actually needs is to go <laughs> beyond oneself to have the dir floor time partners to have the relationships and to go outside one's own comfort zone parenting self to engage to to, to you know kind of showcase everybody's individual differences and and we did that and i think that is what led to this beautiful life for Ben and for all of us and and truly for the community. And you can see it, it takes takes a while. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean to do this. It's not the thing I ever wanted to do, but I don't regret a second of it, especially given how, I mean, you're working obviously for the future. When that future isn't there, you do look back on that on that life and that was it. It was the beautiful, the beautiful life of uh, that 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 extends beyond the physical life, which is the impact that and the philosophy, the impact of of the actual events that occurred that that were beautiful and will go on to change more hearts and minds. And um, and the you know well just everything just that reach out and 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 it's beautiful and a public education can be that beautiful floor time life 
So well said. Thank you so much, Kim. I will put resources and links in the podcast blog post at affectautism.com. Um, thank you. I can't thank you enough. Um, and just thank you for all the work you've done for all of our kids everywhere. Um, and yeah, it just, just so beautiful the way you guys have grieved Ben's life and really, you know, turned it into sharing these wonderful experiences that have helped others and had such a great impact. So thank you so much for being our guest today. Thanks, Daria. Great, great talking with you and have, have me back whenever you want, because I love to share and it, it does honor Ben and it, um, it's a good process for, for our family. Excellent. You, for sure, we'll have you back. <laughs> Until next time, here's to choosing play and experiencing joy every day. Caregivers, I facilitate the International Council on Development and Learning's weekly parent support meetings every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time and monthly on Thursday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern. These are free drop-in meetings to support caregivers implementing floor time with their children. Let us support you in finding the connection and joy with your child as you support their developmental process using DIR. See the events menu at affectautism.com or the parents tab at icdl.com parents.